so much, everybody, for being here. So, I'm just gonna stand for a second, open your ears, listen to the ambient sound. So I'm gonna start off with a journalistic trick. I'm gonna tell you it's a key uh, thing in the, in the journalist bag of tricks, and that is, after you ask somebody a question and you're interviewing, shut up and listen. <laughs> just listen. After they stop answering, don't say anything. Just keep listening. The answers that come after the answer are where you really start learning things. So what did we learn from starting QS? We had a surprise, which was that face-to-face -face meetings were a key element in collaborative knowledge making. Now, face-to-face, -face, that's a pretty ancient technology, maybe we shouldn't have been surprised, but it kind of cuts against the grain of current practice, which involves scalability and automation. So we found that we weren't as interested in the blast radius of numerical influence as we were in a kind of uh, practice, a kind of conversation in which numbers weren't crude instruments of, um, of boasting or manipulation or marketing, but rather common tools that were accessible to everyone and a kind of medium for collaboration. Now, um, people have said that they want to continue this collaboration uh, online, and we spent a lot of time thinking about how could we do that, especially since so much online communication today is really about these kind of blast radius of small messages that are meant to reverberate widely as opposed to about a back and forth conversation which we'll discover. And while we were thinking about it, Dan just did it and built us an old school forum. Um, if you were involved long ago, as many of us were in the world of BBSs, and, um, you'll recognize many of the features and you'll see that it may be that the pinnacle of collaboration and conversation online uh, that was reached in 1995 or 1996 has not yet been <laughs> superseded. Um, we also um, discovered that interest in our topic went far beyond uh, Silicon Valley. And we've had meetups in many cities around the world and many of you were at the conference. It was really the first time we had a chance to see QS projects firsthand from people who were far away. It was an amazing weekend and um, it took me weeks to recover, actually, uh, from the excitement, and we're going to do it again next year. So if you didn't go or you did go and you want to go again, mark your Memorial Day for next year. We're also going to have a conference in the fall or in the, in the early winter in November, late November, um, in Amsterdam to give some people who didn't have a chance to come because it was too far to participate. Um, and you, you probably saw the strong European participation that was at the conference, but there are many more. And if you want to spend your Thanksgiving in Amsterdam, uh, you're invited. Um, now, um, what's missing? Well, if you have, you have QS friends in India, China, Japan, Korea, Philippines, Africa, invite them to share their knowledge. Um, but why do we want to do this? We don't have any institutional mandate to grow or diversify. We're curious. We want to know what people are learning. We know these practices are widespread and global. If you've been coming to QSs, you know that we have a discipline of uh, asking people who monopolize your attention for any length of time to say something that they learned from personal experience. For instance, I'm doing a little meta talk about what we've learned from starting QS. You also know that sometimes it's really hard to maintain this discipline. There's a kind of delirium that's produced by the power of quantitative tools that makes people um, sort of crazy, feel like just uh, uh, piling up the numbers is going to allow them to solve the world's problems without talking them over with anybody. And the sign that they have this delirium is that they um, seek angel funding and start to talk a lot more than they listen. And I say this to you because I love you. Uh, I'd like <laughs> to suggest that you should take advantage of our key lesson here, which is that it helps to touch actual practice. It really helps. We have a quantified self-users guide to self-tracking. It has more than 450 tracking apps. At least take a look at it and see what other people are trying. And Ari and Ernesto are starting a, a startup conversation on the forums that you can participate in. And tonight, for once, we won't interrupt you if you just uh, pitch your, uh, your app and you forget to include your own personal data. 
Um, however, it's not too late to change your talk. <laughs> so if you accidentally wrote uh, kind of a dumb PC pitch instead of sharing something that you actually know, just walk up here without your slides and answer the questions, what did you do, how did you do it, and what did you learn? What did you do, how did you do it, and what did you learn? Those questions are always meaningful. Now, the last thing I want to do is share with you um, really our aspiration. I think we, we'd like to believe that Quantified Self will at some point be seen as belonging to a family of new collaborative practices whose utility comes less from arbitrary institutional factors than from direct sharing of knowledge. Things that are inspiring are sort of free and open source software and Wikipedia and WikiLeaks. Uh, somebody last year in a conversation said something about true credentials, that maybe we're moving into a period where it's possible to, to have true credentials. I thought about that a lot. I, I'd say it if, if it was you, because I'd like to give you credit. Credentials is related to credence, to belief, and new tools and new practices are giving us new means to reflect on the validity of our beliefs. Reflecting on whether our beliefs are valid, I think, is kind of a good way to express the spirit of this meaning. And it's the spirit in which I'll be listening tonight. Thank you.